On today's Winning Cures Everything, it is crazy season for the latest college football news. Uh, we're talking about the transfer portal, of course, the latest coaching moves at Tulane, Duke, James Madison, uh, some coordinator moves, Texas A&M and Kansas, Jim Harbaugh may have a new contract at Michigan. We got CFP debate, a new FBS subdivision, uh, and a whole lot more. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, where we talk college football news, rumors, previews, and predictions all year round. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on X at Winning Cures, or I am on TikTok and Instagram at GaryWCE. This is the Friday, December 8th edition of the show. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you never miss our latest videos, and uh, make sure and subscribe to the BetUS College Football Show. I'm there live every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'm breaking down games with Parker Fleming and Kyle Hunter. Uh, there is a link in the description for that. Uh, this week has been a bit crazy. Uh, so I'm, I'm certain there's some news that you've not heard about. I'm going to try and rapid fire through all of it today, and we'll see how long it takes us, right? Uh, let's go on and start off with the transfer portal. Uh, the portal opened in college football on Monday, December 4th. We've already got well over 1,500 FBS football players that have put their name in, right? Uh, there aren't a ton of massive names, right? But there are some big ones that are looking to, you know, either get out of a spot where their coach left or, you know, a coordinator left or guys that are just looking to cash in and find better situations. Uh, Texas A&M defensive lineman Walter Nolan is the number one overall available transfer per 247 Sports. I imagine, just a guess, that he's going to end up at Tennessee but there are a lot of options for him, right? He's he's going to make some bank off of this. Uh, everybody freaked out about Ohio State starting quarterback Kyle McCord entering the portal. Uh, the story there is apparently he asked for a commitment from Ryan Day that he would be the starting quarterback next season. Day wouldn't guarantee him the job. It's not all that shocking, right? Ohio State used to having great quarterbacks. Kyle McCord, as it stands right now, is the number eight rated transfer quarterback in the portal. Number eight. I mean, that is freaking wild. Uh, there's a lot of good quarterbacks in the portal. They've all got flaws, right? The highest rated is Aiden Childs. Uh, looks like he's going to follow Jonathan, uh, excuse me, Jonathan Smith to Michigan State. But like he didn't, he didn't play this year. But he's he's the highest rated. I mean, that's crazy. It's not crazy to think that Ohio State can upgrade the talent at that position for next season. You got Dante Moore, uh, Cam Ward, Will Howard, Riley Leonard, uh, DeQuan Finn from Toledo. Dylan Gabriel, uh, Will Rogers from Mississippi State, uh, Tyler Van Dyke from Miami, they're all in the top 40. Uh, you got SEC wide receivers that are in the top 10 players in the portal right now. You got uh, you got London Humphreys from Vanderbilt. Uh, he looks to be headed to Georgia. South Carolina wide receiver Juice Wells, uh, he's got plenty of options. You got several edge rushers, um, you know, the kid from, uh, from UTSA. But you know what there's not a lot of, and that's quality offensive linemen. Uh, there's only one in the top 50, and that's uh, Texas A&M's offensive tackle, Chase Besantis. I hope I said that right, at number seven. Uh, one of the crazier things I've seen so far in the portal is Oklahoma State's uh, Gunnar Gundy entering the portal, right? Uh, you know, his dad is the coach at Oklahoma State, and yet he's going to transfer out. I, I, guess, I mean, if you want playing time, I guess that makes sense. Uh, the portal is absolutely wild this year, absolutely wild. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of places you can go to figure out predictions and all that. That ain't my bag. That ain't my bag, my friends. I, uh, I try, but I ain't that good at it. All right, let's talk coaching moves. Now, I normally spend a long time on these, but carousel is winding down. There were a lot of moves this week, so let's go on and dive into it. Tulane is set to hire John Sumrall from Troy as their next head coach. Look, Fritz really built up that program, and the school appears to have put an emphasis on football as of late. So this this could be, should be, a really good hire. I'm a bit surprised that Sumrall would leave Troy where he's already got his culture instilled, uh, at least leaving for another G5 school, right? 
Uh, there's a pretty big difference in resources between Troy and Tulane, I think. I, I think it's a monster hire for Tulane. Uh, I'm very curious where Troy goes to replace Sumrall now. Uh, potentially, they go with uh, uh, Shield Wood, who is the D.C. at Tulane, who was the D.C. at Troy last year. That's just a guess. I I really have no idea. They might go the coordinator route. Who knows? Hopefully, they go with somebody that's got the chops like John Sumrall because he really, really put that place in a good situation uh, after Chip Lindsey. So, uh, moving on. Middle Tennessee. Middle Tennessee has hired Derek Mason. Uh, and after sticking with stock, uh, excuse me, stock still uh, for so long, it makes sense that they would go with somebody that knows the regional landscape, right? Mason, pretty successful head coach at Vanderbilt. He knows the Nashville area. And, you know, after being out of football for the last year, uh, after he was with uh, Brian Harson at Auburn and Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State before that, I am certain that he's prepared for a, you know, a lower tier job with less stakes. But, you know, one that could be easily rejuvenated. Uh, that Middle Tennessee program has been kind of lifeless for a while, uh, but Mason could add some hype, get fans excited for the first time in, in quite a while. Uh, let's talk James Madison. James Madison hired Holy Cross head coach Bob Chesney. Uh, Chesney was going to eventually get a bigger job, and, and this one fits really well, I think. Chesney was up for the Syracuse job as well, um, but going to a school that already has a winning tradition might give him a better chance of success. Uh, you can't do much better replacing Signetti for James Madison than having a, a fun young coach that really knows what he's doing. And I mean, that's Bob Chesney to a T. I mean, he he knows what he is doing. Uh, let's do Texas A&M right quick. Let's hit on some uh, coordinator hires. Uh, Texas A&M, Mike Elko hired Kansas State offensive coordinator Colin Klein. Now, this was slightly surprising to me. I mean, seeing Klein leave his alma mater to go coach in the big bad SEC but at the same time if he wants a real chance to win a national championship I think A&M and and their resources are, are probably better than Kansas State right maybe not historically from a wins perspective but just looking from a conference and resources view I could see why Klein would take the job uh, I think this was an awesome hire uh, Texas A&M I don't know that they could have done a whole lot better than going to get Colin Klein just saying Let's uh, let's talk Kansas. Lance Leipold uh, hired Baylor and uh, and BYU offensive uh, former BYU offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes as their OC, and this one doesn't make a lot of sense to me, right? Grimes was great in year one under Aranda, um, but they let you know Jerry Bohannon transfer out. Blake Shapin hadn't been that good. Uh, I mean, Grimes was just fired by Aranda. Like, Baylor hired Jake Spavital to come back. Uh, how? Think about this. Like, how quickly can a stock rise and fall, right? Grimes was up for P5 head coaching jobs just two years ago. Uh, and now, I mean, he got fired from Baylor. I know that Leipold knows the ball, but this seems like an odd fit. My my guess is uh, Kotelnicki... Uh, and I hope I said that right. The offense coordinator just headed off to Penn State. I'm guessing that he was great at devising a scheme that kind of hid Kansas's offensive line deficiencies. And Leipold would like for there to just not be deficiencies on the offensive line. Now, I think Grimes can help develop the O line, but man, I am real curious about the play calling, et cetera. Right? This one's going to be interesting to watch play out because I that just seems like an odd fit for uh, for Kansas. Uh, Craig Bowl. Wyoming coach, he is retiring after the Arizona Bowl. Wyoming uh, did end up hiring, I mean, on the same day. All of it happened at the, about the same time. Uh, they hired Jay uh, Savell. I hope I said that right. Savell. Whatever. I think everyone here knows how much I love Craig Bowl. The replacement's going to be fine, I'm sure. Uh, he's the defensive coordinator. It stays in line, right? Craig Bowl was the epitome of old man football. His team's always had an identity and that was tough, hard-nosed, always difficult to beat. They were never the most talented, but they're a hard out every single week. So congrats to Coach Bowl. Congrats to Coach Sawvell uh, for getting the gig. Like, that's awesome. Like, Wyoming just keeping it rolling. Keeping it rolling. I like what they were doing. Like what they were doing. The Duke Blue Devils 
hired Manny Diaz. I don't know that a coach has ever been as disrespected as Diaz was with the way that his firing was handled by Miami. Uh, I mean, this man was out recruiting while Miami went behind his back and hired Mario Cristobal. Didn't even have the decency to fire him before they went looking for a coach. Uh, disgraceful. But, you know, business is business, and we get that. Uh, Diaz gets to come back to the ACC after doing, you know, really awesome things with Penn State's defense. He's going to get his shot to take down that same Miami team, which, to me, should be appetizing. Uh, the question for me is this. Was the Duke resurgence all about Elko, or has the school really, you know, allocated more resources to the football program? Uh, overall, I like the hire. I mean, Diaz knows what he's doing. Uh, it's just, is he going to have the support there? That's what I would like to know about. Let's move over to the Mountain West. New Mexico hired Bronco Mendenhall. Like, are y'all noticing a trend here? Nobody's really swinging for like the hot young names anymore. It's like a lot of retreads, guys that have proven that they know how to stabilize a program. Mendenhall in New Mexico makes sense. I mean, the guy has won everywhere he's been. And, you know, with Jerry Kill right over in Las Cruces, that has the potential to be a, a really fun rivalry going forward. There's not a ton of resources at New Mexico, but if anybody's going to know how to utilize them, my guess would be, uh, yeah, I, I think that Bronco would be fine there. I think he's going to be able to win, uh, especially in that conference. So I, uh, I expect, you know, good things. Uh, Louisiana Monroe, they hired Brian Vincent as head coach. And again, older guy that knows football. Vincent was the interim for a year at UAB, and uh, he was the Blazers offense coordinator for a while uh, before that. Uh, he was at New Mexico this past year. I, I think that he really knows ball. He's going to be able to stabilize Monroe. But, and I, I'm curious about this, though. I mean, the UNLV New Mexico gambling investigation, does that tie in Vincent in any way? I'm a little curious about that. Uh, Vincent knows offense. He's going to be fine. I mean, he, they scored more points at New Mexico this year than they have in forever. Uh, what enough to save, you know, uh, Gonzalez's job, but is what it is. Uh, let's see. Let's talk UTEP. Did it, uh, writing my times down. You guys know this is one man show. Uh, UTEP hires a Scotty Walden, right? I'm sure you guys remember Scotty Walden, right? He was, uh, one of the interim head coaches at Southern Miss during the COVID season. Uh, but he's one of those who, who left in the middle of the year to become the new head coach at Austin P. Uh, he was he was named interim coach at Southern Miss on September 7th, 2020, and was hired at Austin P on October 27th, and then he left immediately for the job. Southern Miss had four head coaches in a four-month span there. Uh, uh, just looking at the UTEP job, Walden, only 34. He did good things with Austin P. Uh, I think like UTEP has a very passionate, dedicated fan base. I'm curious to see how this one works out. Like, can anybody win there right now? Or, or is that place just kind of just off too far? You're not going to be able to get enough good players. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how this one works out. Uh, before we jump into, you know, favorite bowl matchups and, and all that kind of stuff, bowl game tickets can get expensive, Right. Get in price for the Rose Bowl between Alabama and Michigan. That's over $500 just for one ticket. Even if you're just going to like the Citrus Bowl in Orlando uh, between Iowa and Tennessee, that's 78 bucks to get in. Over 150 bucks for two tickets. I have got a way to save you some money on that. You go to Ticket Smarter. Visit TicketSmarter.com or use the Ticket Smarter uh, mobile app and use the promo code WCE10. That's going to get 10 bucks off an order of $100 or more. Or WCE20 is going to take 20 bucks off in order of $300 or more. And it's not just for football game tickets. You can use that promo code for concert tickets, uh, NBA, etc. Uh, the best part, of course, this is not just a one-time thing. It's not taking money off your first order when you sign up or whatever. You can use those promo codes as many times as you want to buy tickets. So go to Ticket Smarter, use the promo codes WCE10 or WCE20. Think smarter, Ticket Smarter. All right. Let's talk about bowl games. I, I know you guys are real excited about that. Every year, I give out a list of my favorite bowl matchups, not including the CFP games, because, I mean, of course, those matchups are supposed to be awesome. So let's roll through my top 10 here. 
I'll tell you exactly which ones I like and uh, and why. We'll start off with the guaranteed rate bowl on December 26th. Kansas against UNLV. Offense, offense, offense. Uh, so long as Brennan Marion is still the OC and Lance Leipold is still coaching at Kansas, I think this is going to be fascinating to watch. Like, neither defense can stop anything. It doesn't really matter which quarterback is playing for each team. Neither of these teams has won a bowl game in a while. This could be a lot of fun. I, I expect it to be just ping pong on grass, right? So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That's my number one on that. Uh, moving along, the Pop-Tarts Bowl, December 28th. New, uh, excuse me, NC State against Kansas State. Uh, NC State, they have not had a 10-win season under Dave Doran. They hadn't had one since 2002. That was back when Chuck Amato was the coach. Uh, on the other side, I'm very interested to see what Kansas State looks like without the offensive coordinator, Colin Klein, calling plays since he's, you know, over at Texas A&M now. And I want to know what this offense looks like with only Avery Johnson under center instead of Will Howard. I, I think there's a lot of fun stuff to watch for in this one. Uh, the next one on the board, the Alamo Bowl, number three, Arizona and Oklahoma. Uh, that's December 28th. We get to watch Jackson Arnold play for Oklahoma. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but also, we get to see what the Sooners look like without the offensive coordinator, Jeff Levy. Right? He's uh, the new head coach at Mississippi State. Arizona, they have been awesome with uh, with the quarterback, Noah Fatita. Uh, excuse me, Fafita? Fatita. I mean, what am I talking about? Noah Fafita. Uh, and that defense has been pretty good for most of the year. Uh, Jed Fish against Brent Venables, I think think this one's going to be pretty fascinating, so I'm I am excited about that. Uh, number four here, the Citrus Bowl on January 1st. Uh, Iowa against Tennessee. I mean, this is a contrast to styles, right? Uh, Josh Heupel and Kirk Ferentz could not be any more different from a schematic standpoint. Um, but at the same time, I mean, this season, they're both like run first and play defense kind of teams. Uh, is Joe Milton going to play? Is this going to be like our first glimpse at Nico uh, Yamalieva? Yep. There's a lot of questions heading into this New Year's Day bowl game. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see what that all ends up looking like. The Fiesta Bowl on January 1st. This was number five. It's Liberty against Oregon. Uh, and again, like I said with number one, offense, right? Uh, we haven't seen Liberty play a P5 team all year, much less one that was you know, one game away from potentially making the playoff with a Heisman caliber quarterback. Uh, I want to see what the quarterback, Caden Salter, and Jamie Chadwell's offense looks like against a real-life defense uh, going against Dan Lanning and, and the Ducks over there. So I'm, I'm very excited about that one. Uh, the next one on the board, number six here. December 23rd is the Armed Forces Bowl, and that is James Madison and Air Force. Uh, James Madison may not have head coach Kurt Signetti, uh, but the players are, from everything that I've read, excited about winning the first bowl game in school history and getting to a 12th win. Uh, Air Force completely bottomed out in the last four games of the regular season. They finished 8-4 and four, uh, after starting 8-0. Uh, when is the last time that you saw an Air Force team finish minus 7 in turnover margin? I mean, geez. Normally, service academies are you know must-bets in bowl season. I'm not certain on this one, so we'll... We'll see about that. Next on the list, number six, seven, number seven, uh, the Mayo Bowl, December 27th, North Carolina and West Virginia. Uh, Mountaineers coach Neil Brown, he was on the hottest seat in the country coming into the season. They were picked to finish number 14 in the Big 12. And if they win this game, they are going to finish nine and four on the season, which is absolutely wild. I'm going to guess that we don't see Drake May play in this one, uh, but that North Carolina offense still got dudes, right? You're likely going to see a lot of points here. I expect uh, some explosive plays. Uh, so, yeah. And we get to see, you know, what the future of uh, North Carolina football looks like heading into next year. Number eight, uh, December 23rd, the Camellia Bowl. Arkansas State against Northern Illinois. Arkansas State completely turned their season around uh, by turning to the freshman quarterback, Jalen Rayner. He himself is worth putting this game on this list. I'm curious to see what he's going to do against Northern Illinois' defense. Uh, their numbers aren't bad against the pass, but, I mean, you got to pay attention to who they've played, right? Both of these teams always seem to have just crazy, volatile games with explosive plays, so 
I am hoping for all of that in this one. Uh, number nine on the board, the Gasparilla, uh, Gasparilla Bowl. I hope I said that right. Gasparilla Bowl. Whatever. <laughs> December 22nd, uh, it's Georgia Tech against UCF. And look, we've seen this matchup in the regular season a few times lately, and UCF has just run over Georgia Tech. But this Brent Key version of Georgia Tech a little bit different. The offense has been feisty with uh, with their quarterback, Haynes King, who transferred in from Texas A&M. UCF, probably the most up-and-down team in the country. I mean, this team, like, they blew out Oklahoma State. They got blown out by Kansas. They played toe-to-toe with Oklahoma, lost at home to Baylor uh, after they were up, like, 35-7. to UCF is number six in the country in yards per play, uh, but Georgia Tech's offense is number 28. Like, I'm, I'm hoping for, uh, for some big plays here, hoping for something exciting, and I, uh, I would imagine that we will get it. Uh, my number 10 bowl game, December 30th, the Orange Bowl, uh, Georgia against Florida State. Now, I've got it at number 10 because I just want to see what the teams look like, right? Georgia was number one, lost by three to Bama, and dropped all the way down to number six. Florida State went undefeated and didn't get into the four-team playoff. Which team wants to be here? Like, how many opt-outs are there going to be? What does the crowd look like for this? I imagine the fan bases will get ramped up a bit by the time the game gets here, but, I mean, it's been nearly a week since the game was announced. Neither fan base or team is excited about this matchup. Johnny Wilson, the wide receiver from uh, Florida State, has already announced that he's opting out of the game. We'll see. There's there's other good games here, uh, but those are my 10 bowl games before the playoff games that I'm the most excited to see. Uh, so we'll we'll see about that. Let's uh let's keep the train rolling. NCAA president Charlie Baker earlier this week sent a proposal to several universities that mapped out uh, a potential new division for those athletic departments with more resources than others, I guess. Uh, basically it sets up like this. You have to have enough revenue to be able to pay at least $30,000 a year to half of your student athletes. So, for example, if you've got 500 athletes on campus, cut that in half, so like 250, and give each of them 30 grand. That means that you would have to have seven and a half million dollars that would go directly to student athletes. Now, there are some schools that don't bring in that much money in TV revenue. Right, Sunbelt schools will not be a part of this. Uh, most of the AAC schools are not going to be a part of this. Does SMU fall in? I mean, it's... Anyway, those schools would compete in a different NCAA subdivision from FBS or FCS. Uh, apparently, they're trying to figure out a way to keep schools in conferences, even if they're in different divisions. I don't know how that's going to work, but either way... Apparently, there's not a cap on on how much you can pay. I believe it has to be at least thirty thousand per athlete. I don't know if you can pay some athletes more. Uh, I think it all has to. It's all really early in the works, right? The question, of course, is how many of these schools are going to be interested in competing in this version of the NCAA, and would this effectively give us like a P five playoff and a G five playoff, right? It seems pretty nuts. I think it's a necessary evil. Because the bigger conferences were going to pull away from the NCAA eventually anyway. So the NCAA is just trying to stay ahead of it to figure out what can we do, right? Like, I I would love to see this happen, I think. But I, I really don't know how they would draw it up. And in all honesty, like, how serious is this, you know, if they if they didn't even reach out to, like, a single school in the SEC? Like, Charlie Baker didn't send it to a single SEC school, at least according to Greg Sankey. Um I mean, wouldn't that be the first ones that you would send this to, right? At least 13 of the 14 schools would absolutely do this. I mean, they are, they're all completely aligned on the importance of sports, you know, being the front porch for their school. But, I mean, I may have just answered my own question. Like, they already know that the SEC is going to be in. Uh, I suppose, I mean, you got to see if a school like Stanford, right? Stanford's got over 900 student athletes uh, if they would want to be involved. Or, you know, Notre Dame or North Carolina. Right? Is the number of schools that would want to be involved in, in this new division, is it closer to 70 or 80? Or is it closer to like 35 or 40? 
right? There's 133 FBS teams right now. It'll be 134 next year with Kennesaw State. I think Delaware comes in the year after. That would be 135. Where's the cutoff? Is it closer to 40, closer to 80? I don't know. I imagine we're going to hear more about this uh, sooner rather than later. Jim Harbaugh appears to have a new contract extension from Michigan on the table per several reports, but the interesting part of the deal, at least per uh, Richard Johnston at Sports Illustrated, is that Michigan has a clause in the deal that they want uh, in writing that Harbaugh will not pursue uh, any NFL job this cycle. Uh, The extension would be five years, $55 million, so an average of $11 million per year. That's pretty good. I think he's earned it. But a deal like that says to me that Michigan does not think that there's anything big coming from the NCAA about the Spygate mess or the recruiting stuff or buying people hamburgers. You guys know the drill. Uh, He's already been suspended for six games this season, and his team is still number one heading into the CFP. Like I get why they would want to pay him that uh, because winning is fun, right? Like Especially beating Ohio State. That's a lot of fun. But I'll guarantee this, uh, he'd better sign the deal now because next year's schedule, I mean, it includes Texas, USC, at Washington, Oregon, uh, at Ohio State, along with, you know, other Big Ten teams that could potentially jump up and bite you on the right Saturday, right? So, uh, I would, Jim, don't mess with the NFL, man. Just stick around here. Hang out with the crazies. Let's do this thing. Hopefully he'll sign that deal soon. We'll get to, We'll get it all done. Uh, If you haven't already, do me a favor, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, uh, jump in the comments. I want to hear from you guys on these topics. I would like to know what you think on these individual things. So let me know. Uh, Let's talk. Let's talk controversy. Let's discuss this CFP mess uh, with Texas and Alabama getting in over undefeated Florida State, right? Uh, Stephen A. Smith said on ESPN that this exact same Florida State team, same circumstances, would get into the CFP if Deion Sanders was their head coach. And at first, I kind of scoffed at the idea, right? This is a Florida State team that uh, had the number 55 strength of schedule going into the postseason with their backup quarterback. Uh, The backup quarterback only got like 3.9 yards per play against Florida, who was the number 122 yards per play defense. I mean, that Gators defense was atrocious. But the more that I thought about it, every single season, that there has been any debate around the number four team, it has routinely gone to the team with the biggest TV ratings. Think about it. 2014, Ohio State gets in over TCU and Baylor. Uh, 2016, 11-2 and Penn State beat Ohio State, won the Big Ten, but 11-1 and Ohio State got in at number three, which is just nuts. Uh, either way, 2017... Alabama, who didn't even make the SEC title game, they got in over 11-2 Ohio State. And you go back and look at those TV ratings, Alabama somehow averaged over 1 million more viewers per game than Ohio State that year. That Ohio State team wasn't great. They weren't great. Uh, Funny thing about 2017, Wisconsin likely would have been in the CFP over Alabama if they'd beaten Ohio State in that Big Ten title game. Uh, In 2021, if Cincinnati didn't have Notre Dame on the schedule, if they had not beaten Notre Dame that season, I would have bet everything I own that the Irish would have been in. But, well, all right, so that's also around the time that there started to be, like, more discussion about litigation if the G5 wasn't allowed access, which is part of the reason why we're moving to 12 anyway. But either way, they would have much rather had Notre Dame than Cincinnati. And the ratings certainly bore that out, right? Uh, so Ohio State and Alabama, they're always going to be given the benefit of the doubt, it appears. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, TV ratings. I think there's something to be said about the fact that, you know, TCU absolutely got demolished in, uh, in last year's national title game. Like this year's Ohio State-Michigan game and the Georgia-Alabama game uh, from this past weekend – they all drew more than last season's national championship game. Under no circumstances should the national championship game draw less than a regular season game. Both semifinals drew more viewers on New Year's Eve than the title game. So I I feel like the committee's goal is to get the best matchup that will draw the most viewers. 
That's why they say they want the best teams. That's incredibly subjective. Like, I've said it a million times, right? The next TV deal for the CFP is not done. There's nothing on the books for after the 2025 season right now. Their goal for right now, this moment right now is to maximize how much money ESPN, Fox, NBC, CBS, etc. are willing to offer for the longest amount of time. Florida State drew $9 million for the LSU game opening weekend. Their ACC championship game against Louisville, a battle of top 15 teams with the CFP berth on the line, it drew 7 million viewers. Alabama, Georgia drew 17 and a half million. I, there's a big difference there. Now, do I think it's fair? No, not in the slightest. But college football has not been fair since the dawn of time. Like Alabama won the 64 and 65 national titles, went undefeated in 66, and was ranked number three because Notre Dame and Michigan State played to a tie, and everybody in the Northeast thought those were the two best teams. In 1992, Alabama went undefeated and had to play a three-loss Florida team in the first-ever SEC championship game, and if Shane Matthews hadn't thrown that pick, Alabama might not have a title under Gene Stallings. In the BCS era, right, 2003, Oklahoma gets into the championship game despite getting blown out in their conference championship. Uh, it led to a split title between LSU and USC. College football used to be about more than just, you know, who played for the trophy. Like, pride was at stake. You played who you played, and that was the system. But when you built a four-team playoff, and you've got TV networks involved, and you're attempting to set up the next one, you're not playing for the love of the game anymore. Like, I'm all about capitalism, but there are sacrifices uh, that are made. And a 13-0 Florida State team was apparently a sacrifice for what they hope is a better TV rating in the Rose Bowl this year. Like, next year, none of this crap is going to matter because they will rig up the rankings to get the best possible matchups. But everybody will get in. And, and they tell us that more people will care. We shall see, I guess. So to Florida State, continue with your lawsuits if you want to. You can ask for transparency, but you better make sure that you want to know what you'll find out. Like, does it help or hurt if the answer is, you know, oh, you're not on the same level as these other schools? Does that make you feel better or worse? Like, at the end of the day, if you're Florida State, you joined a league and you ran roughshod through it for over a decade, and then you and, you know, every other P5 school sold your soul when you signed up for a 14 playoff when we all knew that there were five P5 leagues at the time. The math never worked. Like, this was always set up to be a TV show. You agreed to allow a committee to pick the four teams they want in this invitational so that you could collect the checks. Seriously. Like, think about the TV aspect of it, right? Like, why did we play CFP semifinal games on New Year's Eve so many times over the past few years? So the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl could have exclusive TV windows, right? Like, they say it's tradition, uh, but I think we know better, right? Because if it was tradition, the Rose Bowl wouldn't have been played during the BCS on, like, January 4th. It wouldn't have kicked off after dark if they were so worried about the sun setting over the San Gabriel Mountains or whatever, right? Everything has been about TV dollars for at least a generation now. Like, you can you can debate team metrics on the field if you want to and talk about who's, you know, the most deserving. Uh, but the entire 14 playoff era has been about TV metrics. And the next iteration, the 12-team model, will be two. If, if you would like a more wholesome version of college football where things are more fair, you got to go watch FCS or D2. All right, I'm done with that one. Uh, gracious, I don't know how much more I could talk about <laughs> about the CFP. I'm just, it's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. Um, but it sucks. It's, everybody thought that it was about deserving, and it's just, it's never been. I went long on that one. Um, I got to bring up this quote that I saw yesterday, Okay. Uh, Marshall coach Charles Huff was asked by a reporter, uh, Casty Wood, at WOWK in Huntington about starting quarterback Cam Fancher entering the transfer portal. Uh, the quote from Charles Huff was, uh, there is not a lot of money for NIL, and the fans hate him. Uh, the kid has been miserable. So first off, it sounds like he thought he was off the record. 
Like, we're not really used to coaches saying stuff like that out loud, right? But let's kind of break it down. Of course the fans hate him. His numbers had not been good. Like, Marshall, once upon a time, they had Chad Pennington and Randy Moss. I mean, Byron Leftwich led some, you know, really prolific offenses. And now the offense has just been absolutely putrid. I found it interesting that he didn't just talk about the kid being miserable. Uh, the first thing he said was, there isn't a lot of money for NIL. In what world would Cam Fancher be making NIL money? And that's no offense to Cam Fancher, but like, he's a quarterback in the Sun Belt that threw 11 TDs and 11 interceptions for a 6-6 six and six team. Like, I, I don't get it, I guess. Who knows? But it was very interesting to hear that kind of quote from Charles Huff. Very, very interesting there. Uh, again, like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, we've got another lawsuit against the NCAA. Ohio and six other states are suing the NCAA over the transfer, uh, not portal, over the transfer rule, right? Uh, Patrick Morrissey, West Virginia's chief legal officer, he tweeted this out yesterday. Uh, he said, today, in a lawsuit led by Ohio and filed in the Northern District of West Virginia, I joined with six other states to sue the NCAA over their transfer rule. The complaint alleges the NCAA restrains athletes from making, uh, or sorry, from marketing their labor and is in violation of the Sherman Act. Uh, in our complaint, we discuss the arbitrary and inappropriate way the NCAA has treated Raekwon Battle and other athletes. Every athlete must be fairly treated, and no organization is above the law. I'm pleased to join this bipartisan effort and believe the law is on our side. It's time for change to come to the NCAA. Uh, it said, in a separate filing, we're asking the court for a temporary restraining order against the NCAA to bar them from enforcing their transfer rule. So, the NCAA has no teeth anymore. And we've talked about this for several years now, but they, they cannot enforce their own rules anymore. And this, this kind of ties back into the CFP stuff, right? Everybody's trying to make money. It's all about money. The NIL stuff goes through. Um, you know, kids want to make money off, off playing at different schools and this and that. If a kid transfers too many times, knowing full and well that it's against the rules... Now the kid or the school or the state or somebody is just going to sue the NCAA to get the rule off the books. They'll claim the law is keeping the player from earning, you know, the maximum amount that he can as an athlete, regardless of whether or not he knew the rules, right? Like pretty soon there won't be any rules at all, which is fine for the schools that have all the resources, I guess. But I don't know how the smaller schools are supposed to compete in this landscape. Like I'm all for kids getting money, but by God, I would love for lawmakers to worry about something that matters, you know, at some point. Florida lawmakers wanting to sue the CFP because their team didn't get into the right bowl game or whatever. Like, guys, there are people in the state of Florida that can't afford insurance because of the number of companies that have just decided not to offer insurance because they're actually having to pay out when disaster strikes, which I thought was the whole purpose of insurance. But regardless, uh, these... These lawsuits, everybody gets fired up. Oh, yeah, take down the NCAA and whatnot. It's like, guys, there has to be rules at some point. There, there just has to. You can't have just complete, utter lawlessness. But cheers to the kids for getting paid, I suppose. All right, I got to close up shop. Uh I will close with this. I saw a tweet by Matt Winter at Winter Sports Law on X, right? Uh, it says this. Jerry Cardinal of Redbirds Capital is doing a great job of explaining how and why private equity is coming to college athletics. Uh, as he says, college athletics is a hugely undervalued asset. Says it needs to consolidate its media rights like they do in the NFL. Now, this was said at the Sports Business Journal's Intercollegiate Athletics Forum. Uh, I made a pretty big deal on this show about Florida State potentially uh, getting a private equity firm involved in, you know, trying to find a way to get out of the ACC back over the summer. The interesting thing that was said here is 
that college football needs to consolidate its media rights like they do in the NFL. Now, the the SEC's new TV contract with Disney runs through 2034. The Big Ten goes through 2030. Uh, those are the two biggest ones uh, that we that that really matter. I think when we talk about consolidation, uh, the ACC, we know that one goes through 2036. The Big 12 is through 2031. Uh, but didn't we already have consolidation? Right? Like, once upon a time, the NCAA had the TV rights for every university under their umbrella. And then the universities of Georgia and Oklahoma sued all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in the summer of 1984, the soul in my opinion, of college football, started to die. Now, I was born in 1983. This was well before my time, right? Uh, but after that Supreme Court hearing, conference realignment really became a thing. It was no longer just about regional ties with uh, similarly aligned academic institutions, but about which schools could make the most money from television by joining together, consolidating, right, and selling their media rights as a group. In 1992, we had the first ever SEC championship game. I brought it up earlier. It was an undefeated Alabama team and a Florida team that already had three losses. But Alabama won, so it worked out, right? Never mind the fact that Florida had two conference losses already, and it shouldn't have come down to an extra game. It was just another game that the conference could sell to a TV network for more money. In 1998, we started the BCS. Each of the big bowl games got to host the national championship game in a rotation, right? ABC paid, if I remember right, like $550 million over eight years for the rights for all those bowl games. Um, in 2006, uh, they created an additional game, right? The national championship game. And that was packaged up and sold along with the, all the other bowl rights. Uh, some of these, you know, the Rose Bowl got to have a Rose Bowl and a national championship game. The Sugar Bowl had a Sugar Bowl and then a week later a national championship. I mean, it was just... Whatever. Um, the Rose Bowl TV rights alone were sold to ABC for eight years, $300 million. I think that Fox paid around $300 million to broadcast all of the other big, you know, BCS bowls for like four years. Uh, you get to 2014, and it became a four-team college football playoff. And by consolidating, they got ESPN to pay an average of $608 million per year for the rights to the CFP and the New Year's Six Bowls. Now that was compared to like 150 million or 155 million that they were paying for that group of bulls prior to that. Uh, the 12 year, four team playoff contract was worth $7.3 billion. 12 years, $7.3 billion. And apparently, a new 12 team model could be worth over $2 billion annually. So 10 years. $20 billion? I mean, it's just, it's bananas. So if a 12-team playoff is bringing in that kind of money and a Big Ten TV contract is currently worth over a billion dollars a year for like 16, to, well, I, I guess 18 teams now, whatever, how much would a Super League of around 32 teams bring in? And yes, I'm using 32 because that's the number of teams in the, uh, in the NFL, right? The NFL's new deal, it's worth over $125 billion dollars. For the next 10 years. That is, that's $3.92 billion per team or $392 million per team per year. That's absurd. And, and they could stand to make even more, right? Big 10 teams are, are hoping to get close to $100 million in their current deal, and they don't even have to pay the labor. It's going to change eventually, of course. But either way, if a Super League forms, uh, could they get... $200 million per school per year, right? I mean, we're talking Michigan, Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, Texas, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, maybe. I mean, who, who knows, right? It's a slippery slope. We've seen what happened to bowl games once it became all about the money. At what point do the fans of those schools I just mentioned, right? Bama, Ohio State, Michigan, et cetera. At what point do they not care as much about their football team when they're losing four games a year. How important is chalking up wins between big games as opposed to playing other big name teams and, you know, potentially losing more of them? Right? Hopefully what I'm saying makes sense. 
Like, I get what these uh, private equity people are saying and what they're doing and what they're wanting to do. But at some point, the bubble's going to burst. I mean, you can ask ESPN about that. Like, it, it was just a few years ago that they were convinced that they had it made. A hundred million cable subscribers, and they're making ten bucks off every single one of those people every single month. And then it's gone. All right. It's going to wrap up today's show. Sorry I went a little long. Uh, it's been a while since we've done a show like this, so I'd, I may have ranted a little bit. My apologies. Uh, next week, we're going to get into bowl previews and picks, so hopefully you guys will be ready to rock and roll for that. If you're not already, please uh, please subscribe uh, to the channel, and uh, and please like the video for me. Share it out. Tell your friends. Hit that notification bell. Uh, if you want to support the show, go to buymeacoffee.com slash winningcures, or you can sign up to be a member right here on the channel. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at GaryWCE or on X. I am at Winning Cures. Uh, make sure that you are subscribed, of course, to the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, we are live over there every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, and make sure that you check out uh, Ticket Smarter. Use the promo codes WCE10 or WCE20 to save some money on your tickets. There's a, there's a link in the description for that. Uh, with that said, let's get out of here. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football. And uh, hopefully, all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.